people have been waiting for something. Hey, we're going to start like in 30 seconds. <laughs> well, we should just start now. Are you good? Yes. Yeah, okay. Peter, why don't you introduce me? Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, BMCC. My name is Peter Bratzis. I teach political science here. And uh, I'm happy everyone was able to turn out on a day that the university was, we had no classes scheduled because of the holidays. But still, we have a uh, good amount of people. Uh, obviously, we're all here to hear Slavov Zizek speak. Slavov has spoken at CUNY multiple times. I was in the audience. What I, I suspect was the first time, maybe 1992 or 93, at the old Graduate Center on 42nd Street on uh, Kant as Theoretician of Vampirism was the title of the talk. And that had a, a very big effect on me. After that, I started reading uh, much more so Lacan and uh, psychoanalysis and Zizek, obviously. So it was a, a big event uh, in my intellectual Development and hopefully from, from, from that point. From that point, it was that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, very happy people uh, are here for the talk. I would like to first introduce uh, Michael Pelius, who's a professor of philosophy at LIU Brooklyn, and who is also uh, uh, from the Institute of Radical Imagination to uh, present to us a slab of Zizek a. Uh, Certificates. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do two things. I don't have the actual certificate, but let me do this first. Um, Peter Bratzis and I are the co-founders of something called the Institute for the Radical Imagination, which is an attempt to uh, offer alternative education. And we have been doing this now for uh, close to eight to ten years, and now we have a coalition with the Left Forum um, and the Marxist Educational Project, as well as uh, what's the third group? Democracy at Work, right, with uh, Rick Wolf. So we're trying to put together classes. We have a schedule that you can find on our website, radicalimagination.institute. A schedule of classes with the pre-Socratics on Monday, German idealism on Tuesday, um, method from uh, Aristotle to the Soviet uh, School of Dialecticians on Wednesdays, and Marxism after Marx with Stanley Aronowitz on Saturdays. After that, Barb, I want to say we also have something, a new idea, and a new uh, project called Prosperity Marxism. And in the spirit of that, we are going to uh, give the first award, which is forthcoming, to Slavo Zizek as a prefiguration <laughs> and a uh, prototype. We're going to Prosperity Marxism. Get check You'll get a good, very nice check. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. You know, you know how the signifier works. You yeah, have a yeah, bar yeah, through yeah, the yeah. signifier. So we want to thank you so much for coming to CUNY. He wanted to do this, and uh, I've heard him many times over the years, but this is a real first, I think, at, the, at this level, and we thank you so much for coming. So. I'm going to keep these uh, brief. Um, welcome, and thank you for coming out. Uh, I wanted to express my gratitude to my friend Slavo Zizek for volunteering his, his time this evening, emphasis on volunteering. Uh, tonight was the only time we could fit Slavo in due to his busy speaking schedule, this New York trip from Slovenia. So uh, in that spirit, we wish our Jewish friends an easy fast for Yom Kippur and hope tonight provides a different kind of nourishment. Um, Slavoj confirmed that next year we'll have much bit more ironed out logistics and he's agreed to speak at Hunter College. Uh, and, and, and Michael Pelius uh, reminded me a few months ago that Derrida spoke at Hunter College right after Mandela got out of prison. So, you know, Slavoj will have, um, you know, Interesting oh, shoes to follow. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, two names apart. Yeah. Uh, we hope tonight will be will offer an opportunity for Slavoj to clarify his stance on a cluster of issues in which I think he has often been misunderstood. Um, uh, I just returned, and I have some just brief remarks. I'm just going to put Slavoj in, in discussion with a couple of the theorists. Um, I just returned a couple nights ago from Toronto from a gathering to honor the Titan Fanon scholar and Ghanaian philosopher Otto Sechi Otu. In Sechi Otu's recent Left Universalism Africa-centric essays, 
which engages some of Zizek's work. The professor throws down the gauntlet that to my ears resonates with Slavoj's own interventions. Seciotto writes, quote, but such is the vicious paradox of some critiques of universalism from, from Africa and the global south. Their obsessive compulsive Eurocentricism, their willful captivity to the very discourse they are avowedly sworn to divulge and dethrone. Their exclusive preoccupation with the things the West does with words in order to enforce its particulars as universals. Their trained habit in contrast of being utterly incurious regarding what our grandmothers do with words of evaluative judgment that have universals for their predicate. It is as if the purveyors of Eurocentricism and their critics drink from the very same cup and end up inebriated in separate beds but with kindred distractions. That must be the reason why universalism is chief among those ritual anathemas of anti-imperialist, or as they say, counter-hegemonic discourse, end quote. Likewise, in an important 1990 collection by D.H. Melham, entitled Heroism in the New Black Poetry, my late comrade and friend, Amiri Baraka, who Slavoj has great admiration for, states in a famous interview, quote, the question of montage is impossible without Sergei Eisenstein, whether they know it or not, end quote. In that spirit, perhaps the question of universalism that Zizek has so eloquently engaged is truly a black radical protocol, whether they know it or not, end quote. To conclude, consider Sigmund Freud's famous analogic gloss of revisionism from his 1916 essay entitled The History of the Psychoanalytic Movement. Freud writes about Carl Jung that Jung, by his modification, has furnished psychoanalysis with a counterpart to the famous knife of Lichtenberg. Jung has changed the hilt, he inserted into it a new blade, and because the same trademark is engraved on it, he requires of us that we regard the instrument as the former one. One of the reasons I have such great respect for Zizek's voluminous scholarly production is that in his commentary on the likes of Schelling, opera, sexuality in the void, Lacan, Hegel, Robespierre, Bjork, Malcolm X's name change, and Mount Seton, just to name a few, is that Slavoj, in his close readings, consistently changes the proverbial hilt and blade without dulling its impact. So it is my great pleasure to introduce him this evening. Friends, welcome Professor Slavoj Zizek. Yeah, yeah, we, we're out at nine, so we're good to go. We have time for okay. Slavo to talk and for a good discussion. Now, I will do something probably very risky. I know that many so-called leftists, I don't consider them true leftists, are disturbed by what I wrote about Donald Trump, as if I have even a minimal sympathy for him or some of my critical remarks on LGBT plus and so on, which incidentally I absolutely unconditionally support. I just think that the ideology, the terms in which this discourse is presented are often suspicious. So please, at any point, either interrupt me or uh, criticize me forever, and I will try precisely to address here in my introductory, whatever you call it, speak or whatever, this uh, most problematic uh, topics, which brought me a lot of uh, hatred and so on. Uh, uh, but I think there is a good sign in what I am doing, because I noticed that, for example, when my book on September 11th, uh, 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 Welcome to the Desert of the Real, was published, my friends in Israel and, of course, on the West Bank in, Pal in uh, Palestine or in uh, Egypt told me that it was attacked from both sides at the same time. In Jerusalem Post, they claim it's the most perfidious uh, anti-Semitic propaganda, Al-Ahram wrote in a review, 
that, that it's uh, a deeply Zionist book. I remember uh, Jean-Paul Sartre who said if for the same short book if you are attacked from both sides, it's a good side. <laughs> that maybe you are on the right path. So allow me, hopefully, to clarify some misunderstandings or to make things even further, just feel free to attack me and so on. <laughs> so I would like to begin with an, an, a, just another sorry, introductory point. I'm so sad that I didn't risk to go more into a philosophical topic, because that's how I got to know him. Who was it? Boots Riley. Who, yeah, Boots Riley. Who wrote me, and I loved his book on echoes in art of, uh, of uh, the Haiti Revolution, the Sound of Verdure and so on, which I always this is a permanent point that I repeat obsessively. And I think that's what we need today in our political moment. We don't need geniuses. There are enough of geniuses. Your president, beloved, uh, uh, Donald Trump, he regularly designates himself as a stable genius, I think, you know. We need what Kierkegaard called the opposition to genius apostle. You are just a bearer of truth, you repeat again and again the same point. We need women who display toxic masculinity. That's why I like that girl, she is not totally manipulated, she is not a, a fake, Greta Thunberg. She is an apostle. She doesn't pretend she is a genius, she just repeats the same point, the same point, in this wonderfully aggressive way. She proudly displays her uh, illness, and, but let's not get lost in it. What I like, allow me a little bit to improvise, in your book, how you connect Haiti Revolution, echoes in, you mentioned Eisenstein, who planned to do a, a movie on Toussaint Louverture and so on, all the topics, because I think that against this identity politics misunderstandings of multiculturalism. I think we should learn to respect, to reassert true authentic multiculturalism. For it, as you demonstrate it there in your book, and, and, and I love this, I'm sorry we don't have to, time to debate it here, but for example, this is why I think true Marxists are not cheap historicists. It's not, oh, to understand Shakespeare you have to know all the uh, Elizabethan history and so on and so on. No, it's, if anything, it's the other way around, I claim. To understand Elizabethan England, read Shakespeare. You will learn more than reading some boring histories, but you know what fascinated me? How often the best movie versions of a great work of art, novel, play, are the ones which transpose this work of art, the story, if it's a novel or whatever, into a totally different cultural context. This is from the authentic multiculturalism. For example, Hamlet. Yeah, we all like Hamlet. The best cinema version of Hamlet that I know. It's not Laurence Olivier, this or that, it's... Do you know that Akira Kurosawa did in 61 a Japanese version of Hamlet, set in a big um, a corporate uh, uh, company. Hamlet is a student, Toshiro Mifune, who, Mifune played by, who comes from the West, discovers uh, his father was killed, uncle, blah, 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 with a beautiful title, it's an ingenious title, Bad People Sleep Well. You can download it for free. Or the best Dostoevsky that I know is Hakuichi, I think. Again, Kurosawa, 47. I think that this is the true greatness of a work of art, that it survives transposition into a totally, uh, into a totally different culture. This, what Walter Benjamin would have called this historical openness, unfinished character, when we come too late, later than the original work of art. This is a privilege for us. I claim we can understand Shakespeare today better than Shakespeare himself understood himself and so on. But let's not get lost. Just to tell you that I would so much like to debate more about your topic, uh, philosophy, works of art and so on, but let me do the boring political stuff. Okay, allow me to begin. 
Today, apocalyptic visions abound, and we are confronting a, a true antinomy of apocalypsis or apocalyptic reason. The predominant rightist reaction to the warnings about the looming apocalypse is that these warnings are part of the desperate radical leftist strategy to sustain the revolutionary zeal. That's the, and so here also I think, but especially in Europe, this is the usual mantra that leftists feel betrayed by history, where is the revolution and so on, so they cannot accept that at least in the developed Western country we live relatively comfortable lives, so they need to invent uh, or to construct some threat of a final apocalyptic catastrophe. And that's why they, they focus, for example, that's the reading of uh, ecological threat. Nothing really great or dangerous is happening, it's just the leftist, the leftist trick to keep the momentum. Uh, of course, I radically disagree with it. The only thing I do agree with is that, and here, if we want to be true leftist, we must always emphasize this point, that ecology is today a great field of ideological investments, of ideological battles. For me, at least, the most dangerous ones, apart from obvious ones, which are just leave it to the market, tax the polluters, everything will be okay, or leave it to the science, are a, this, let's call it, let's call it, uh, 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 mother nature ecology. This falsely anti-anthropocentric, self-humiliating perspective. There was once, I don't know when, some kind of uh, uh, homeostatic balance on Earth. Then we humans come with our hubris, exploiting Earth natural resources too much, we hurt Mother Nature, Mother Nature is taking revenge now with global warming and so on and so on. So we should return to our modest role and so on and so on. I think this is cata catastrophic. First, I cannot imagine a worse version of anthropocentrism than this fake anti-anthropocentrism. When all these mother nature ecologists claim we should ac accept that we are one tiny species on Earth, what they are really interesting is not nature. Let's accept it. Nature is, if we even should talk like this, I doubt, nature is brutal, totally indifferent. They claim we may destroy life of, on Earth. As we know now from ge uh, geological history and so on, nature itself was ruining itself repeatedly all the time. I always make this point, just think about our still main sources of energy, which are coal and oil. Can you even imagine what type of total catastrophes had to happen on our Earth so that we got oil reserves and coal and so on and so on? Nature doesn't care. So it's not nature that we worry about. We just want a safe environment for us. When they talk about a balanced environment, it means we want to survive in a safe environment and so on and so on. Nature is not our mother. If, sorry for the provocation, nature is our mother, it's a dirty bitch of a mother. <laughs> totally indifferent. Don't mystify it and especially accept that nature is not some primordial uh, uh, homeostatic stability that we disturb. No, nature is, I consciously use this term, nature is deeply unnatural. That's the beginning of, for me, leftist materialist ecology. But there is another version of ecological ideology that I hate even more. It is uh, this, uh, how should I call it? everyday anti-consumerist consumerism. Because uh, what's our usual predicament when, uh, how does society, I'm not a paranoia, there is not uh, some central committee hidden in the depth of Manhattan with all those 
they, they are what fascinates me most. I would like to join them. I heard that deep in the tunnels beneath Manhattan, there are around 1,000 people who live all the time there. You don't even know what happens there. But maybe they, they I'm not saying there is the Central Committee of Reaction there, but how does society address us with a, sorry? They're called the moles. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's wonderful because yeah, you know what Marx wrote about moles yeah, yeah, history. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. No, no. What I want to say is that uh, 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 the typical movement of those in power uh, counter move is. Uh, this is Jordan Peterson applied to ecology, if I put it. Is, but who are you to just criticize big companies and so on? What did you do to prevent pollution? And then they give you a set of easy tasks to make you feel well. Like, did you recycle all your newspapers? Did you put aside all Coca-Cola cans and so on and so on? And this is, I think, a wonderful uh, ideological operation. They prescribe you the role to play, recycle and so on and so on. It makes you feel well and you can go on consuming and so on. My ideal capitalist, ecological capitalist here is, it was 10 years ago, now it's different, it's Starbucks, the company, no? I remember 10 years ago when I entered the Starbucks coffee store, I hate it, just to meet friends there, uh, you always get big posters like something like, uh, like every 5% uh, of all our profit from cappuccino goes to save some Guatemala forest to feed, uh, the, to feed orphans in Somalia, whatever you want. And this is a wonderful ideological operation. The message is, you can go on consuming because the price for consuming, the price in the sense of the way by consuming you hurt environment, you hurt other people, is included into the price of our commodity. So, you know, like, you are threatened, feel threatened by our commodification, no problem, the price for this is included, you, you can do it, and this brings me to another aspect of ecological ideology, which is uh, uh, this false sense of quantification, you know, like, you take, now even on plane tickets, I think, they give you how much monoxide you produced, uh, how much did you um, uh, yeah, all that stuff and so on. I think the function of this is strictly to be brutal. Don't underestimate ideology here, to make you feel well. Now I will be repeating an old joke of mine, uh, uh, very vulgar, but it's true. I think that and I even read an analysis done in my own country, maybe we are especially perverted, Slovenes, where they, they ask people who are buying organic apples, you know, those rotten apples which cost double the nice chemically uh, manipulated apples, why they are doing it? Do they trust it? And they got a shocking answer. The answer was, of course it's probably manipulated, these apples are even worse. But it makes me feel well that if I buy those apples, I did something for Mother Nature, for the sense of solidarity, and so on and so on. So just don't underestimate all this stuff. But let me go on. So nonetheless, in spite of all this, I think ecology is a mega problem. And But return to my main line, uh, that uh, the right-wing narrative today of uh, 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 global warming deniers is precisely, no, it's a leftist plot, the same as LGBT plus uh, and all that stuff. The idea is this one. The left is aware or was aware already from early 1920s that there will not be a big expected revolution. So they knew they first have to demoralize our Christian societies to ruin us from within. So. They, it's a wonderful, I like conspiracy theories. The idea is that the money that enabled Max Horkheimer to organize Frankfurt School, it was not from an Argentinian student of Horkheimer, but it really came from Moscow. Stalin personally decided that we have to first corrupt the West intellectually. We need psychoanalysis and so on. So, 
they financed from the very beginning Frankfurt School and so on and so on. But okay, you know what's my answer to this right-wing uh, guys who want to dismiss uh, ecology as pseudo-apocalyptic vision? That unfortunately they have their own apocalypse, which is double, their own apocalyptic vision. One is, uh, of course, the one that I already mentioned, European civilization is under threat now, immigrants and so on. And the other aspect of the apocalyptic vision that I already mentioned, LGBT, feminism and so on and so on, all that stuff. Uh, so they also speak the language of apocalypse. So again, we don't get one apocalyptic discourse. We have a conflict of apocalypses. And here I remain a classical Marxist. This, when every phenomenon that you analyze, always try to isolate in what sense it, it includes its own, its own, I don't want to use the term contradiction because it's a very precise term, let's call it its antagonistic, its own opposite tendency. And I even, and this, what I will improvise on now, is not a criticism in any sense. I think that this would be my point, for example, allow me a brief improvisation, and this is my dream, as you know, maybe, to do just this introductory improvisation and to skip the talk itself then, you know, so it's like to have a burger but only with lettuce and so on with no meat, you know. Okay, let me go on. Uh, so, uh, uh, they can tell you that. Sorry? They can tell you that now. They're already yeah, doing yeah, yeah, yeah. it. I was told that Burger King already had now a hamburger without meat and so on. Okay, let's not get lost. Uh, you know, to, why am I for LGBT plus or transgender? Precisely what fascinates me so much is a certain immanent antagonism. The official, let's call it, ideology of LGBT plus is something that I, without any irony, benevolently, would have called Judith Butler historicism. Gender identities are not biologically determined, it's socially, historically constructed through performative, discursive gains, and so on and so on. Okay, but what fascinates me so much is that, and I know many of them, uh, all those guys who actually make transgender operations, they speak a language which is exactly the opposite one, which is an it brutally, openly, I use this term prohibited by today's discourse theory historicist, essentialist language. Repeatedly, persons who, for example, underwent this painful operation from man to woman, I noticed how almost always they use this term, I am so grateful that now finally I live in a body into which I should have been born. The language they speak is one of pure essentialism, in the sense of it is as if there is a basic sexual orientation inscribed into my whatever we call it soul, but there was just an, in my birth an ontological mistake, as it were, I was born in a wrong sex. Now, I don't think this is simply ideology. That's crucial. I think that precisely the reference to psychoanalysis, German idealism and so on, allows us to explain in a materialist way how something which is contingent can nonetheless be experienced as your predestination as a necessity. As we learned from Freud or from great German idealists, your truly free decisions are not conscious decisions. Your conscious decisions are rather superficial. You are, am I doing no, no, something no, no, wrong? No, no, no. No, 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 no. I thought you are, no, no, no. I thought I felt like Khrushchev on Crimea no, when no, no. Brezhnev <laughs> was making a plan to depose me. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me go quickly on it. What I want to say is that just, uh, if this sounds to you something abstract and so on, allow me to use my eternal old examples. Isn't it that the highest free acts are precisely always experienced as necessity. For example, let's say your country is occupied, you have to join resistance. 
You do it because you feel that you would betray yourself not doing it. It's not a choice in the sense of strawberry cake or, or, or vanilla cake or whatever. It's, I do it because I cannot do it otherwise. Or, a more pathetic example, think about love. You fall in love. You never fall in love. In the sense of, I'm looking around, nice lady or nice man here, there, let me make a choice. No, all of a sudden you realize that you are in love. The decision is never made in the present time. And what I'm saying is that this LGBT essentialism makes this clear. If you want to, in a trans operation or just in a more superficial way by cross-dressing and so on, if you want to change your sexual identity, it is, we can account for it nicely, how it is still a contingent free decision of yours but it has to appear to you as a necessity. Why? Because it's a radical decision. Or usual decisions, like do I choose, I don't know, this type of water or coke or whatever, there you are already constituted as a subject and you just make choices. But radical decision is where, in a pathetic sense, you choose yourself. And again, that's all I'm trying to, to do. What I don't buy in the usual LGBT plus ideology is this happy free-floating identities, you know, like I can be multiple identities, today I'm gay, tomorrow I'm heterosexual, then I jump here and there and so on and so on. No, they underestimate terribly the pain, the traumatic decision of assuming a certain sexual identity and the greatness of transgender is for me precisely that it brings us very close to this radical level of freedom. Okay, but let's not get lost into this, just let me go back to uh, apocalypses and to the choice of, sorry, to the antinomies. We get antinomic apocalypses, we get ecological apocalypse, we get reactionary versions of the apocalypse and so on and so on. Why this, why should we not trust the so-called, I hate them most, mostly, uh, probably, so-called rational optimists, uh, Steve Pinker and so on, who claim, but wait a minute, we are living in wonderful times, there were never so little wars and so on and so on. Maybe they are right, a lot of their data are probably True, but you know what's my fear there? I wonder if you would agree. Today, with the rise of the new right, we often hear uh, this idea that we are like in late or early 1930s. Fascism is coming back. No, I think the situation is more dangerous. We are kind of a, again, in the, the best historical parallel would have been the decades before World War I. Because don't forget, the true catastrophe of Western, or at least European history, was World War I. Before that, we had 50, 60, 70 years of, in Western Europe, not around the world, unimpeded progress. Women, more or less, in some countries at least, got vote rights, universal, <coughs> universal vote rights, retirement plans, and it was an immense progress. But nonetheless, people were more and more aware already from, I think, around 1890 that a catastrophe is coming. And they were right. Although people didn't believe that it could happen. And at least in our developed part of the world, let's face it, from 1945 till about 10, 20 years ago, this was, at least in the developed countries with social democratic hegemony, these were relatively happy times. That era is coming to an end. And when my right wing, I don't have friends, uh, enemies, tell me, tell me, uh, tell me, but communism brought just ruin and so on and so on, I tell, tell them, okay, many horrible things happened, but the original catastrophe was World War I, and for that, sorry, you cannot blame communism in any way. It was pure imperialist, capitalist matter. We cannot even imagine what shock it was 
for Western Europe, how from that ideal of 70 years of progress we approach Qatar and we are in that type of a situation. So let me now finally approach my proper topic. So where are we today? What is the meaning of Trump phenomenon? Let me do it slowly, systematically. Not such a long time ago, in a galaxy that now appears far, far away, of course, you know to what I refer to, to the movie series successfully destroyed when Disney bought it over. No. <laughs> the public space was clearly distinguished from the obscenities of private exchanges. Politicians, journalists and other media personalities were expected to address us with a minimum of dignity, talking and acting as if the common good is their main preoccupation, avoiding vulgar expressions and reference to personal intimacies. There were, of course, rumors about the, their private vices, but they, that remained, they remained dead. Private matters mentioned only in the yellow press. Today, however, not only we can read in the mass media about the intimate details of public personalities, populist politicians themselves often regress to shameless obscenities. One should not lose sight of what is so surprising about this rise of shameless obscenity of the old right, as so well noted and analyzed among others by Angela Nagle in her Kill or Normis. Traditionally, or in our retroactive view of tradition at least, shameless obscenity worked as subversive, as an act of undermining traditional domination, as depriving the master of his false dignity. I remember from my own youth how, in the 1960s, protesting students liked to use obscene words or make obscene gestures to embarrass figures of power and, so they claimed, denounce their hypocrisy. However, what we are getting today with the exploding public obscenity is not the disappearance of authority, of master figures, but its forceful reappearance. We are getting something unimaginable decades ago, obscene masters. Of course, Donald Trump is the emblematic figure of this new type of obscene populist master. And the usual argumentation against him, that his populism, worry for the well-being of the poor ordinary people, is a fake, that his actual politics uh, 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 protects the interest of the rich, is, I think, all too short. The followers of Trump do not act irrationally. They are not victims of primitive ideological manipulations which made them vote against their interests. They are quite rational in their own terms. They vote for Trump because in the patriotic vision he is selling around, he also addresses their ordinary everyday problems, safety, permanent job, and so on and so on. When Trump was elected president, I was asked by a couple of publishers to write a book which would submit the Trump phenomenon to a psychoanalytic critics, uh, claiming that this is something so crazy that is happening, we need psychoanalysis. How could people buy Trump? My answer was that we do not need psychoanalysis to explore the pathology of Trump's success. The only thing to psychoanalyze is the irrational stupidity of the left liberal reactions to it. The stupidity which makes it more and more probable that Trump will be re-elected. To use what is perhaps the lowest point of Trump's vulgarities, the left has not yet learned how to grab Trump by his pee. <laughs> Trump is not winning because just by shamelessly bombarding us with messages which generate obscene enjoyment at how he dares to violate the elementary norms of decency. Of course, that's the basic operation of Trump. We are shocked all the time. How dares he do this? He violated all the unwritten rules of decency. But through all his shocking vulgarities, he is providing his followers with a narrative which makes sense. Of course, a very limited 
twisted sense, but nonetheless a sense which obviously does a better job than the left liberal narrative. His shameless obscenities serve, serve as signs of solidarity with so-called ordinary people. You see, I'm the same as you, we are all red under our skin, and this solidarity also signals the point at which Trump's obscenity reaches its limit. Trump is not truly obscene. When he talks about the greatness of America, when he dismisses his opponents as enemies of the people and so on, he intends to be taken seriously. And his obscenities are meant to precisely emphasize, by contrast, the level at which he is serious. They are means to function as an obscene display of his belief in the greatness of America. And incidentally, I read a couple of days ago how it's incredible these turns and twists of American right-wingers, how they try to reappropriate Hegel. First it was Fukuyama, you know, uh, 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 justifying liberal democracy in pseudo, of course, Hegelian turns as the end of history, the ultimate, the best possible, or at least the least worst social order. Now, a couple of days ago, check it up, please, in uh, 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 National Review, uh, Ro Rafe Rolf Peters, again claimed to understand Trump who must go to Hegel, that Trump practices Hegelian politics of recognition. His message to ordinary people is, in contrast to liberal establishment, I recognize you. Uh, this is why, in order to undermine Trump, one should begin, begin by displacing the side of his obscenity and treat as obscene precisely his serious statement. Trump is not truly obscene when he uses vulgar sexist terms. He is truly obscene when he talks about America as the greatest country in the world, when he imposes his economic measures and so on and so on. The obscenity of his speech masks this more basic uh, obscenity. So, let me go on to elaborate this point a little bit more. Now, even some po a point which may be more problematic for you. My doubts, although I would like to see him deposed, of course, my doubts about the campaign for the impeachment of Trump. Okay, my first problem is, of course, Trump at least talks a lot, but then he is nonetheless, it looks so afraid to go to war, North Korea, Iran, and so on. Well, frankly, if you ask me if you get rid of Trump, you get Mike Pence. And I have my doubts who would be worse. But my point is another one here. Uh, you see, here we have to look for ideology. Again, as they say in politically correct jargon, trigger warning. You may find problematic what I will say now, and I'm open here for you to capture attack. Uh, Trump is portrayed in this calls for his impeachment as an individual pursuing his own private interests, not as the representative of a state and its apparatuses. The guy whom we should trust, Edward Snowden, from his Moscow exile, immediately got this point, commenting that a quote from a recent interview by Snowden. And incidentally, I think Snowden is quite a heroic figure. He makes it again and again clear the point that he doesn't like to be in Russia. He would much prefer to be in Sweden, in Germany, and so on. They just don't want him. They're afraid of the United States. Okay. Snowden wrote, commented that, quote, a whistleblower's complaint which triggered Trump's impeachment inquiry is strategically quite wise in its focus on the president versus an institution. Congress could be more than happy to throw an individual abu abusing its office under the bus in a way that these individuals are not willing to do when they themselves are implicated by the same allegations. This whistleblower is doing something that's a little bit unusual. Uh, their, uh, the, their claim is that an individual is breaking the law 
who of course happens to be the president, end of quote. So the way I read Snowden's complaint is the following one. It is acceptable to criticize an individual which breaks the law while he pursues his private interests or pathological inclinations, revenge, lust for power, and so on. But it is much more difficult to discern a crime in the activity of state institutions, a criminal activity which is performed by personally honest individuals dedicated to their job. Evil and crime are here not individualized but inscribed into the very functioning of institutions. That's why I find, again, uh, problematic the calls just to impeach Trump. Trump is undoubtedly a repelling person lacking a basic moral compass. However, what about the systematic violations of human rights in the continuous activities of the US intelligence agencies? The true enemy are not idiosyncratic figures which act as a disturbance for the establishment. The true enemy are honest, patriotic bureaucrats ruthlessly pursuing the United States goals. To name names, the model of such patriotic bureaucrat is, as far as I can judge, James Comey, you remember, the FBI director deposed by Trump. Although at the level of facts, Comey was probably mostly truthful in his critique of Trump in his bestseller, A Higher Loyalty. One should nonetheless admit that his higher loyalty to the principles and values of the United States leaves untouched what one cannot but call the criminal tendency inscribed into the U.S. state institutions, all that was revealed by Assange, Snowden, Chelsea Manning, and so on. One should also not forget that the movement to impeach Trump is mostly motivated by the desire to prove that Russia influenced the last presidential elections, enabling Trump to win, while there undoubtedly was Russian meddling, incidentally in the same way that the United States tried to influence elections all around the world. Just in that case, we call it a defense of democracy, of course. <laughs> the focus on this prospect obfuscates the true reason of Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton's defeat, her ruthless struggle against Bernie Sanders and the leftist wing of the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders was right to warn that, and I quote him here, that if for the next year, year and a half, going right into the heart of the election, all that the Congress is talking about is impeaching Trump and Trump, 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 and Miller, 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 and we are not talking about health care. We are not talking about raising the minimum wage. Uh, we are not talking about combating climate change. We are not talking about sexism and racism and homophobia. What I worry about is that it, that works in Trump's advantage, end of quote. You see, that's my point here. I don't have time to develop it, but that uh, don't be fascinated by individuals. The horror of today's global capitalism is, and this is always what fascinated me in my analysis even of traumatic parts of the left's inheritance, Stalinism and so on. Don't fall into this trap of portraying the executors, even of Stalinist crime, as evil, sneering individuals pursuing private goals. No, the most horrible evil is the evil, again, inscribed into the basic functioning of institutions themselves. For example, all that we learned, again, from Snowden, Manning, Assange. All that was, I guess, mostly performed by people who thought that, that they are doing a good thing, they, their patriotic duty, and so on and so on. And if you want a historical, no, historical means cinematic for me, for, uh, not Hollywood, but German example that gave me this idea. Uh, uh, you know uh, which one I like? Uh, here, the idea, it's the uh, uh, which movie, did you see the movie which was a hit some 15, 15 years ago, The Life of Others? I claim that movie is false, 
And paradoxically, although it wants to be fanatically anti-communist, it's not radical enough. Why? You know the story, to cut a long story short, a corrupted minister of culture, it looks, in German Democratic Republic, want to screw the wife, beautiful wife, of a famous playwright. And to get rid of him, he orders the secret police to follow him to find some problematic points so that he can get rid of him. But you see, it's the same problem as now with Trump. You, the movie locates the evil into, in a typical liberal way, into an individual person who pursues his uh, dirty private sexual interests or whatever. It could be something else. But I claim the reality of East Germany was that even if all Stasi members and so on were just honest Stasi members not doing it for their private satisfaction of their vices but just to do what they saw as their duty, control anti-socialist forces, all the oppression would have stayed there. So again, don't, with all the absolute disgust I feel for Trump, don't make this mistake of locating the evil into private person, the true pro into private person with, with vices and so on and so on. The true evil is the evil of how our state machineries work. The true evil, the true problem for me is what was disclosed by all the whistleblowers and so on, how a new type of control is developing, where big private corporations like Facebook, Google and so on closely co coordinate their activities with NSA and we are getting today new forms of control of which we are not even aware. Usually our media, when they report on this, they refer safely to China. Oh, the Chinese, they have that each of us has a certain patriotic number, how high it stands. We are doing the same thing, just in a little bit more subtle way. The true problem of freedom today is precisely unfreedom, which is experienced as freedom, which is not even experienced as unfreedom. I'm almost getting uh, 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 nostalgic for the good old times when you look back, oh my God, is somebody following me? I'm not free. No. Today, what is the, the most free thing that you can do? You surf on the web, you do whatever you want, a little bit of hardcore, a little bit of my son taught me. My son can enter the dark web and so on. Uh, 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 you do this, what can be more free than this? You just do what you want. The more you do this, the more you are tightly controlled. We, we live in, okay, I don't totally agree with that lady, but she is on the right path. Zuboff, surveillance capitalism and so on. That's the problem today. Again, don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, uh, personalize evil. Okay, I want really to leave the time for uh, uh, debate, so let me just add uh, two more points. This is why, if you ask me, I think, as you already hinted at, quoting that uh, um, uh, African philosopher, that uh, the question of at uh, this level of a political project uh, the question of universalism is crucial. What I admire, although they are making stupid mistakes, like what Assange was doing is deplorable, but it doesn't in any way just justify what is now happening to him. This was maybe the most successful in the last decades character assassinations. I know I visited him regularly. All the stuff that you maybe read in the newspaper, that he was painting on, uh, with his feet coloring the walls of the embassy of Ecuador in London and so on. That's mad, complete madness and so on. But what I want to say is that uh, a new form of universalist politics is emerging there. On the one hand, we have ecological politics, which is, again, by definition, universalist. If there is anything that if there is something clear about ecology, is that we have to move beyond sovereign states. We need some kind of international mobilization. It's global. 
And the same goes for these new forms of digital control, and the same goes for the third problem today, refugees, and so on and so on. I'm often abused for being ambiguous, racist even about refugees and so on and so on. No, my point is a different one here. My point is that refugees, okay, I fully admit I wrote about it, that refugees, I know more about Europe than about your situation here. In Europe, uh, refugees are clearly the result of the activity of Western powers, without American attack on Iraq, without what is happening now in Syria, without what is happening now, now, now in Yemen, where a new wave of refugees is created, and there wouldn't have been refugees. So we are absolutely responsible for it. The ultimate example for me is the Republic of Congo, Congo Kinshasa. It's a state which is usually portrayed as a rogue state, central power doesn't function. Yes, but precisely as such, a nightmare of a state with around 10, 100,000 uh, child warriors. You know, they discovered you take a child of five years, you put him on drugs, five years later you have a perfect killing machine and so on. But as such, Congo is fully integrated into world economy call down all other precious mines, just local warlords are dealing directly with our companies and so on and so on. So what I want to say is that, about this, is that, uh, uh, is that what, uh, with refugees, yes, that don't get caught into liberal humanist topic of treating refugees as a humanitarian problem. It's an economic socio-political problem, the moment you formulate it in this way, oh my God, thousands of people waiting on the border there, will we open our hearts to them or not? You are mystifying the situation. You are turning it into a humanitarian problem and more and more I suspect this in Europe, that this fits perfectly the ruling liberal elite. In this way, they steer up a conflict between one and another group of underprivileged poor people, refugees and our own poor people, who, of course, it's also part of ideological manipulation, feel threatened by refugees and so on. And so it's a very comfortable position. At the same time, you dismiss your own poor people or their primitive races and so on. You have a conflict there, but your position is safe here. So for me, it's absolutely crucial to insist. We should make a step backwards and change our geopolitical stance, the economic politics and so on and so on. There is the solution. Don't turn it, because it's ridiculous. If we reduce it to a humanitarian problem, then the point is simply what? That all the poor from third world countries will move to the developed countries. First, this is not happening now. The truly underprivileged remain there in horrible conditions. I read a very good analysis in Europe about who from Syria, Iraq, and so on, who comes to Europe. Mostly, large majority, brutal, half-criminal young people. Why? Not because they are bad. Because they are the only ones who are strong enough to do it. First, you need a couple of thousands of euros to get there. And the, the truly poor ones remain there. This is just breeding, breeding a catastrophe. More radical, much more radical economic measures are, we need them here. Next even more problematic part. Now I will do, uh, uh, now I will do something to really annoy you. That's why, uh, although I of course totally support uh, black liberation in the precise sense of as a Hegelian I support it. For example, you know, black lives matter. I totally, precisely as a Hegelian universalist, I totally reject it the stupid white liberal counterpoint made, among others, by Trump himself. No, why only 
black lives matter, all lives should matter. No, it's a lie, because that's, we are dealing here with what Hegel calls concrete universality. In every concrete historical situation, a certain type of ra racism, state violence, is the concrete type which stands for universality. Today, you have a lot of violence in the United States. But you cannot say, let's just look at, at all of it. What happens by the state apparatus police to black people is the emblematic figure. You know, it's the same paradox, maybe I exaggerate a little bit, as if to research uh, racism in Germany in 1930s and ignore anti-Semitism. No, if you talked about racism, then you had to mention, that's why. I, but nonetheless, uh, I... Uh, now I come to my final point, maybe problematic to you, but it's crucial. My reference here will be, and I say this to provoke you, I think these lines are more actual than ever. The black activists that I really appreciate is those who are aware of the traps of identity politics. White liberals love identity politics because <laughs> If you look closely at how it functions, it reduces the other underprivileged to a particular identity. White liberals love Native Americans uh, uh, who dance their folkloric dances, who have some shitty deep insight into how we shouldn't objectivize nature. You know, before you mine a mountain, you should ask the spirit of the mountain and do it if you are allowed all that stuff. They love it. What they don't like is if those underprivileged don't just play the game, we want to assert our particular identity, but no, sorry guys, what we are oppressed in a much more radical way. We want to oppose you at the level of a different universality. The only true struggle is the struggle for universality itself. And I would go to the end here, and now I slowly am coming to an end, just uh, one quote, surprising for you, and then one uh, wonderful Jewish joke. With this I will finish. Uh, first the quote, it will maybe surprise you. Who is it from? You should be remembered today. Huey Newton, the founder and theorist of the Black Panther Party. He so clearly saw, half a century ago, the limitation of local national resistance to the global reign of capital. He even made a key step further and rejected the term decolonization as inappropriate. His point was that one cannot fight global capitalism from the position of national unities. Here is his statement from a unique dialogue. This was a beautiful, sublime moment. In 1972, Huey Newton had a dialogue with Eric Erikson, the Freudian psychoanalyst, who was deeply sympathetic, white guy, old white guy from Europe, but deeply sympathetic to the Black Panthers. And uh, here is what Huey Newton said. I admire this. Quote, we in the Black Panther Party saw that the United States was no longer a nation. It was something else. It was more than a nation. It had not only expanded its territorial boundaries, but it had expanded all of its control as well. We called it an empire. Now, at one time, the world had an empire in which the conditions of rule were different, the Roman Empire. The difference between the Roman and the American empires is that other nations were able to exist external to and independent of the Roman Empire, because their means of exploitation, conquest and control was all relatively limited. But what we, when we say empire today, we mean precisely what we say. An empire is a nation state that has transformed itself into a power controlling all the world's lands and people. We believe that there are no more colonies or neo-colonies. If a people is colonized, it must be possible for them to decolonize and become what they formerly were. But what happens when the raw materials are extracted and labor is exploited within a territory dispersed over the entire globe? When the riches of the whole 
Earth are depleted and used to feed a gigantic industrial machine. Then the people and the economy are so integrated into the imperialist empire that it's impossible to decolonize, to return to the former conditions of existence. If colonies cannot decolonize and return to their original existence as nations, then nations no longer exist, nor, we believe, will they ever exist again, and so on, and so on. That's where we are today. The problem of uh, identity politics, where I have a problem with it, is that it presupposes that, how should I put it, that identities exist. I don't think they exist. And that's my problem even with, for example, certain versions of LGBT to make a jump. I'm approaching the end. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, of LGBT plus. Uh, my, uh, my idea, uh, perception is again and again that they still accept the fact that we have gender identities, they just want to expand the list. It's not just the traditional binary masculine feminine, it's and then you get 30, 40 uh, boots, bisexual, uh, 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 multisexual, uh, asexual, uh, whatever you want. But uh, the way, to repeat my old joke, maybe some of you know it, the way I would approach LGBT is, as a Hegelian, my favorite moment of it is the plus. LGBT plus. What is this plus? There is the wrong British empiricist reading of it. That plus simply means maybe there are some identities that we didn't yet discover, so we should keep a mind open. What if tomorrow a guy comes who said, I am a trigender boots or whatever, oh, sorry guy, you were not in the list, we will add you to the list. <laughs> but if there is a lesson, is that today subjectivity is this plus itself, non-identical, this idea that you can be plus in the sense of excess over identity. And this is today's subjectivity, the plus itself. The psychoanalytic name for it is hysteria, feminine hysteria, which we should not read it in a male chauvinist way as a uh, hysterical women. For Jacques Lacan, this is the highest mode of subjectivity. Lacan emphasizes that all creative science not university science, where you just report on the results, but creative science is hysterical. Hysterical in the sense of what? What is hysteria that is most fundamental? It's precisely questioning your identity, even at the most primitive level. I'm sorry to be so vulgar. But if you are heterosexual and love a woman, and the woman asks you this eternal stupid question, it can be annoying, tell me why do you love me? Of course, there is no answer to this one. The moment you answer it, you are not truly in love. But you know, what is, this is the basic hysterical question. You, the discourse of the master society, you are telling me what I am. A wife, a servant, whatever. Why am I what you are saying that I am? This basic doubt of your identity, which precisely opens up a universal a universal dimension. Okay, let me stop that and to leave some time for debate, just the concluding joke, which will make the point. It's a well-known, I'm sorry if you know it, I used it two, three times in my, in my books. It was also used already by many philosophers, even Derrida. I know Derrida used it. A joke about Jews gathered in a synagogue on Shabbat to publicly declare their failures or whatever. And first, a mighty rabbi says, forgive me, O oh God, I am nothing, not worthy of your attention. After him, a rich Jewish merchant says, forgive me, O oh, oh God, I am a worthless nothing. Then a poor ordinary Jew steps forward and says, forgive me, God, I am also nothing. At that point, the, it doesn't matter who, the rich merchant steps, a rich rabbi and said, but who this guy think that he is? He thinks, how, how dares he also to claim that he is a nothing? <laughs> <laughs> so we are the nothing. That's the white liberal lie today. I literally 
uh, uh, experienced the same situation already 25 years ago at a very politically correct conference where white liberals were excelling each other into who, who will humiliate himself more. <laughs> we are to blame everything. Oh, Eurocentrism, we brought slavery, it's nightmare, we are guilty of everything. Christianity, the worst one, it was invented to screw other races and so on and so on. And then a black friend of mine, not to embarrass him, I'm not making it, he said, well, wait a minute, guys, we are not so innocent. We also had our own Louis Farrakhan, uh, black racism and so on, and I noticed that the mighty white liberal professors exchange these embarrassed gazes, which means precisely, no, sorry, guy, we are to blame, we are nothing. Who are you to say that you are also nothing? <laughs> the message was clear. Precisely when white liberals humiliate themselves, like, uh, and I noticed this again and again, like, oh, we are worthless, uh, we don't have the right, like, if, uh, that's a subtle racism expressed in this forum. If you are an exotic nation, like if Native Americans uh, dance their tribal dances and so on, that's perfect, they are asserting their particular identity. If I say, let's assert German identity, oh, you are a Nazi, you are a fascist. Okay, I know in what sense this is true. But nonetheless, there is something false in it. Why? Because denying you the right to your particular identity in this false sense humiliating yourself means that in a much more subtle way you reserve for yourself the universal position. I notice again and again how this same white liberals who are ready again and again to humiliate themselves, we are the worst, we are guilty of <laughs> everything, and they like to play this game, like whenever that something horrible goes on in third world countries, it must be a consequence of colonialism, you know, which as a black friend that I have from Nigeria, once he exploded and said that this is the worst racism he can imagine. They treat us, he told me, like children, we are not even allowed to be evil on our own. If we are evil, it must be uh, uh, effect of colonialism and so on and so on. And that's why I claim white liberals love identity politics. It means minorities can have their particular identities, but we renounce our identity, but we keep this role of guardians of universality. Which is why, I wonder if this is also your experience, it's my regular experience that this same self-humiliating uh, uh, white liberals have no problem of correcting minorities if they perceive their position as wrong. Like, sorry guys, you fell into colonialist trap here, this is not the right way to talk about it, and so on and so on. So, that's why my advice is the one already elaborated, I've written about this a lot, I will not uh, 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 repeat myself, it's the one for, of Malcolm X, he was a true universalist. I'm sorry if I repeat myself here. Malcolm X, it was a Hegelian stroke of a genius. He emphasized it. X doesn't mean, oh, white people uh, stole from us our roots. Yes, but his point is not, so let's regain our roots and look for some original tribal identity in Africa. No, he saw this being deprived of roots. X, like, we don't have our particular identity, as a unique chance for the black people to propose a new universality which will be much more authentic and radical than white people's universality, which is still, uh, which is still a false universality. Always remember this. The true struggle is the struggle for universality. And liberals like to Trans, like to transform, mystify this struggle into the struggle of particular identities, where then they can play their game, you know, of your particular identity, my particular identity, let them coexist, and so on, and so on. No, the, again, the problem today is the struggle of universalities. We have traditional liberal universality, which is the universality of particular modes of apply, and then, but the problem is how do you define the universal dimension? The problem with particular 
identity politics is that it never can be all of your position. Every particular identity politics implies a universal dimension of how you construct the space in which particular identities coexist. Traditional version is the one of legal illusion. This was, I otherwise I respected him, Richard Rorty's position, that people should be allowed their particular identities and the only universal frame is liberal law which, uh, which uh, 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 organizes society in such a way that we all tolerate each other and so on and so on. I find this vision of particular identities and universality catastrophic. I think that precisely, here I remain a Marxist, what interests me is not my particular identity against your particular identity. It's the antagonism of my particular identity, the antagonism of your particular identity, and can we link our struggle against our own oppression, domination with yours? Can we link my antagonism with your antagonism. That's why, to conclude, in spite of all his failures and so on, I see something nonetheless unique. I don't have any great hopes of it. Probably it will alter and wrong, but I like this idea of Bernie Sanders plus the squad. The squad. Because we get what? We get young, non-white women, radical, relatively, radical politics, and then we get Bernie Sanders, an old white man. It's a winning <laughs> coalition, okay? What Bernie Sanders got, I know, I was not in contact with him, but in Burlington, I often go there with his people, and they said his obsession was for long years. For us, we should precisely also aim to get the votes of those disappointed poorer white people who would have otherwise voted for Trump or whoever there. That's the winning coalition today. Don't sacrifice any of the, any of the two sides. If you do sacrifice old white men, not in the racist way, but in the sense of all those who feel betrayed and so on, then you will, you will get with all your political correctness and so on, you will get Trump re-elected again and again. Again, I want to get not just rid of Trump. My message, and this is what caused so many misunderstandings, is that don't just fight Trump. Ask the crucial question. We lived till 10 years ago, maybe even less, in something like liberal hegemony. We had right-wing version, left-wing version, Republicans, Democrats, but basically it was a very a homogeneous space. Then Trump happened. How could this have happened? What was wrong with the white liberal hegemony? The only way to really defeat Trump is to ask this self-critical question. If you just focus on Trump, you get caught into liberal nostalgia for the good old principal times and so on and so on. Just to conclude with my usual story, uh, that's why I don't agree, I find it deeply problematic, Handmaid's Tale, the novel. It's, I think, what... Of course, I am also horrified by this convincing depiction of uh, uh, male fundamentalist uh, terror and so on and so on, but what bothers me is this one, is this thing. I think that Handmaid's Tale is basically a work of what Frederick Jameson called nostalgia for the present. It paints a near future of fundamentalist rule and it makes us feel well. And you see, haha, we are not yet there, we are still in a liberal society. No, the true question is, but, and it's never addressed in the novel, but how comes that out of this liberal paradise, Republic of Gilead exploded? Or for us, how comes that Trump exploded? We should be critical towards ourselves. Otherwise, 
Trump, if there will not be some catastrophe which would be a nightmarish New World War or whatever, Trump will get re-elected. So my paradox is that it's not what democratic establishment is telling us. The only way to win Trump is to be more moderate, to get centrist votes. No, this was what Hillary tried, Clinton, and she lost. The paradox is that the only way to really win over Trump is to get the votes of all those, metaphorically called, uh, 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 old white men, poor guys who feel uh, dispossessed and so on, and we only can get their voices by moving more to the left. It's not even, forget about those stupidities, do you want Venezuela and so on. We live in very strange times where, look at Bernie Sanders' program, measured by the standards of European social democracy, Half a century ago, Bernie Sanders is a very, very modest social democrat. Sweden, 60 years ago, was incredibly more radical and so on. So this tells us a lot about our predicament, where to, to, to claim what was absolute standard, normal for Europe, Western Europe 60 years ago, now you're accused of wanting Venezuela or whatever you want and so on and so on. No, we should not be afraid of it. And that's what all I mean with that unfortunate statement, Trump can be put to good use and so on. Trump did something, it was horrible, I admit. But something that we should not be afraid to use. He seriously disturbed the hegemonic ideological establishment predicament. He introduced a crack there. And we, the left, have to make a choice. Will we react in a panic? Oh my God, it's horrible, so let's join hand with centrist liberals and so on. Or, or will we say, why don't we do the same and use this opening to this open situation where we shouldn't use loose nerves, where again, it's a crack in hegemony. United States are approaching a kind of ideological civil war. Don't be afraid of it, use it. Thank you very much Thank for you. your patience. All right, now that Sava cleared up everything, um, we're going to have a, a Q&A and a discussion. And, and, you Is know. a good Stalinist? Did you do what's your duty? Did you distribute the question? No, no, no. This is... It, You're what, still bourgeois. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know. But yeah, I mean, you know, please feel free to, to share your thoughts. Please, you know, try to... You know if you have to frame your question, that's fine. Um, you know. But, but, but try to ask a question. It would be helpful for... Would it be possible, please, if you ask me a question and I answer it immediately as short as possible? Because I'm getting a little bit old and senile, and when there are too many questions, I forget one, and then I'm accused, oh, why did you avoid that question? You know, yeah, so we, we got like a good 25 minutes, half hour, yeah. so we're good. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your patience. Um, so I'm going to um, try to defend Gaia, because I think Very cool. someone should. Gaia, uh, the concept of yeah. mother nature yeah. as, yeah. as, yeah. as mother. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think uh, you talk, uh, I think, very uh, accurately about sort of the plus and uh, universalism in, in identity. And I feel like you are drawing the line on the identity of us as a species um, when really there, there isn't that much unique about us as a species. And if, as long as we keep drawing that line, we are never going to have the sort of change that we need in order to survive. That it, I mean, there's another apocalypse coming. It's a climate apocalypse, and I don't think we're we're never going to have the sort of change that we need in behavior and in thinking, and then uh, ultimately in the way we operate to survive. And I think in order to have that change, don't you think that we need to sort of abolish that identity and embrace uh, the thought of us as being part of nature and nature as mother or lover or whatever we want to see nature as? But, uh, no, but again, okay, what, please, please, remain here. I want okay. to engage in a brief dialogue with you. You know, I'm a Stalinist policeman. You will not just provoke Comrade Stalin. You will get, 
KGB strike <laughs> back. <laughs> Sorry, you know what I mean? But okay, but but why why why? I this is a very serious problem. Yes, what we are doing with nature catastrophes and so on and so on. But for me, even to use these terms, mother nature and so on and so on, this resuscitates a certain picture again, which I find problematic. How then do you react to what I said that? What kind of a mother is this fucking nature? It's destroying itself all the time. It's incredible catastrophes and so on. Why call it mother nature? Why not simply brutally tell it, say, we need, we humanity, certain conditions to survive? And we must, it's very brutal statement, egotist even. We can only survive, at least for the time being, who knows how we will genetically modify ourselves. And we need to make sure that these conditions will persist. Why? I don't see that need into all these pathetics of uh, mother nature and so on, you know. It, it brings a false safety for me. Yeah. Mother Nature, who knows what will happen? There may be a volcanic explosion. What will you do then? Which yeah. will ruin us all. What will you then? Oh, Mother, why did you betray us or what? <laughs> Catastrophe. You, you see what I mean? Mother Nature, the term substantializes too much nature into some global, basically benevolent power. Yeah, but I mean, that's the thing. Mothers are not necessarily benevolent. Mothers can also spack you. And uh, my mother certainly did. Yeah, and, 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 and the story spank you is nonetheless, you know, good mother spanks you to make you better. <laughs> but I mean, but I think, I think it's a still a very sort of um, human perspective to see everything from the, from the point of view of our survival and from the point of view of our pain and what we like. So even if we define it this way, even if we say these are the conditions that we need to survive, sure. that actually is no guarantee of survival. We can be hit by a comet tomorrow. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and there's, yeah. no, there's, no, there's no way, you know, there's no sort of getting out of the uncertainty of life. There's, there's no way to get out of it. The, at some point, we have to perhaps embrace the fact that we live in an uncertain universe um, and then there's going to be pain, and there's going to be catastrophe, and there's going to be bad things, but there are more reasons to embrace what we are as natural beings. Those reasons include the fact that we come from the earth, and we are a, a part of it, and it doesn't matter um, whether it always gives us good things or bad things. So that's one reason. The other reason, of course, is the very practical reason that if we need, it, need to have the kind of revolutionary change we need, we sort of need to imagine ourselves as different from what we have so far imagined ourselves. You know, we imagine ourselves as separate from nature, yeah. and I don't think that's something that's going to sort now, of work for us. This, you know? What you said now is perfect. I just have two points, uh, uh, not against it even, but just I will try, maybe I'm wrong, to draw the consequences from it. First, when you say, but we are part of nature, no? Yes, we are part of nature precisely when we are destroying nature, and that's nature. Mm -hmm. You know, don't paint us as there is mother nature there. Oh my God, we are violating mother nature in our most destructive. We are part of nature. Second thing, when you, you know, uh, what surprises me is that when I hear this argument, it's not only like, you know, this is why some radical ecologists or deep ecologists even talk about, now it's very fashionable to talk about, not human rights, but rights not only of animals, and incidentally, for maybe sentimental reasons, I totally under underline this, agree with it, like, I mean, for example, when I was young, I had the misfortune of visiting in Slovenia, uh, 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 not a pig there, even worse, uh, uh, a chicken factory and so on. I mean, it's unimaginable what happens with this industrial agriculture and so on. But what I'm saying is that this idea that we humans should also uh, uh, admit, acknowledge, I wouldn't call them human rights, some kind of spiritual rights or whatever you call them, of not only of animals and plants, but even of habitats, for example, in Nordic countries. I had a friend in 
how do you pronounce it here, Island or Iceland, Reykjavik. Yeah, they have this idea that habitats also have the right. Yes, but habitats don't know this. The paradox, the beautiful Hegelian paradox is that when we are claiming this, we again exempt us, humanity, into the only universal species. Other species are just stupid, caught into themselves. We are the universal species. We are ready to talk about the rights of all others, and which is nice, but you know, the, the paradox is that whenever we talk, we are just, we say we are just one of the species. Yes, but we are at the same time the only species who knows this, who is the universal species. And so this just complicates things for him. Although, you know what would interest me? The last provocative counterpoint to you. Uh, uh, is maybe we agree more than it may appear, because what does this, maybe I'm too much caught into my Hegelian <laughs> philosophy, because uh, practically, probably, we would have agreed, you know. We would have agreed, and I'm given going to the end here, and we would say that that's why to provoke people, I know. I still remain faithful to the term communism. Of course, not the communism of 20th century, but look, what we urgently need to deal with the digital threat of control, to deal with immigrants, to deal with ecological threat. I will call it in very neutral terms. It's clear that market cannot do the job here. It's clear that state intervention alone, especially if we are dealing with sovereign state, cannot do the job. There has to be some transnational universal agency. That's all that communism means for me, beyond sovereign state. I think, and that's why I like, it, with all their ridiculous stuff, people like Greta Thunberg, like Snowden and so on, they stand for a new universal ethics where it's no longer the point of ethics where Trump and Putin agree the patriotic ethics. It shocked me how Putin, in a recent interview for BBC, he said, betraying your country is the greatest crime imaginable. No, I claim the greatest ethical act imaginable is betraying the interest of your country when your country is wrong. This is the actual universalism. This is what people like Edward Snowden did. We need this new universalist ethics, which is a very difficult thing to do because, as I developed in my last books, uh, our entire ethics, Hegel saw this well, but we must move here beyond Hegel, remains the ethics of sovereign state. Our ethical idea is this one, Hegel developed it. We, in our daily lives, when there is peace, we live in civil society, we pursue our private interests, money, fame, love, whatever, but then the true test is the war. When your country is in danger, and Hegel so clearly, the point is not just the enemy, that war has an ethical function for Hegel. It's the point where you have to, as it were, confront, assume the basics. That you are also the individual ready to risk your life, the highest ethical task, which is nonetheless grounded in the necessity of war. The only way you are actually a universal citizen when you move beyond your particular identity is war, which is precisely grounded in patriot. We have to move beyond this into new universalism. Otherwise, I can well understand how, why Trump and Kim, the North Korean Kim, are close friends now, so I read. They are both still, what's so charming in a terrifying sense about North Korea is that it brings this logic of state sovereignty to its absurdity. You know, like, state sovereignty, sacrifice for your country is the absolute thing. We have to move beyond this. And why don't I use simply the term socialism? Because it's too discredited today. My God, I read an interview with Bill Gates where he says, I'm a socialist. <laughs> Everybody is a socialist today. It just means we need a little bit more social care and so on and so on. And now, don't tell me, do I want uh, Venezuela or Stalinism and so on and so on. No, these were nightmares. I admit it. 
I'm just saying a new form of collective agency will have to be invented. And I hope here we do agree. I, I, I agree. You know, I, I think, which is really quick, I think all you guys are waiting to talk. Oh my right? God, okay. sorry. Yeah, so sorry. you should let them go Thank because you. we don't I'm have sorry. all night. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, please. Thank you. I will try to be shorter. I apologize. No, it's all good. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just coming as a creator, content creator, film creator, and and, and on the topic of antino antinomies of uh, apocalypse, um, I wonder. I have it written. I wonder if you see a correlation between what, what you've always brought up about the uh, ever increasing and new forms of apartheid, and, and like such as the the border. Also, wall. ecological apartheid. That's what I like. How uh -huh. ecological threat? We are clearly the. You know, we talk about. Sorry, to interrupt. We no. talk about the threat of apocalypse. In many third world countries, it's not a threat, it's already happening, my God. Sorry, go on. I yes, and, and uh, I guess this is more along the lines of the, the refugees with the border yeah, yeah. wall and the, 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 the parade marching from, from South America. But, um, and the correlation between that and, and what, what I think of as a content creator, the dissipation of the, the fourth wall. Uh, how how in um, and so we have, mean by this? You uh, the fourth wall from media is like uh, from the outside in. It would be like shows like The Office or House of Cards or a show like Dead uh, like Deadpool. The characters where they talk to the camera, and then how we also have our culture from from the selfie culture from from in to outward, and how uh, people are more and more addressing something in front of them or some other uh, 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 the other in the con. I think who who would be just uh, the the uh, semblant other or. Someone who's exactly. kind of your peer, other, but you, you, this dissolution of this wall while increasing. Uh, this is walls. a wonderful point when you make. I, I don't have enough time, also too tired to answer it in detail. <laughs> I would just like to give you an example, which will probably disgust and shock you, <laughs> but it's in my nature to give it. You know where it's a very crucial, important function of this breaking the fourth wall, addressing, and so on which I think we can draw a deep feminist message from it. Don't kill me. Trigger warning. Now they, <laughs> they say uh, hardcore pornography. If you had the misfortune of, of ever watching the standard heterosexual hardcore pornography, did you notice that the ultimate iconic scene, that the, first they break the rule, but that's why it's anti-feminist. Uh, did you notice how in a standard heterosexual hardcore pornography. I haven't seen almost none of them, my friends. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, we are ready. None of us has seen any of it we just talk about. Yeah, the, this, uh, the actor, the guy who screws the lady to be vulgar, is a pure objectified instrument. Often you don't even see his face. He just bang, bang, does it. Yeah. The, you, the standard iconic archetypal scene is camera is in front of the lady laying on a couch on a bed, her legs spread, you see in close up the guy penetrating her, yeah. but then between the legs they, took, they take great care that you see at the same time her face and she looks into the camera and uh, I will not do it, I can't. <laughs> You know what this point, something very important, that there, it's not simply a problem of objectivizing the woman, it's an enforced, humiliating subjectivization. The woman is not just turned into a passive object. The woman is doubly humiliated. She is fucked, but at the same time, she, what you as a viewer, are looking, you don't, that's a crucial mistake that many analysts make, you don't identify with the poor guy who is screwing the lady. He is a pure instrument, usually a, a guy, poor guy with tattoos, some cheap sailor they got and so on. The, you, I, you just are desperately looking for the signs that the woman really enjoys. You are a pure gaze and I think this enforced fake subjectivization is the true humiliation of the woman. She is not just objectivized, she is at the same time falsely subjectivized. But again, what interests me, and here is my crazy association linked to your point, is that, uh, it's, and I deeply agree with you, I immediately explain why, is that uh, it, uh, uh, it's how this, the points where the fourth wall is broken are absolutely crucial in every ideological 
edifice. And even in movies and so on, it often happens that you don't even notice this, but the fourth wall breaks down. Or I would put it in terms of German idealism. This is the point of what they, German idealists, called reflexivity, where you are not just witnessing a scene, but you are inscribed into the scene. Your gaze is part of the scene. And that's the typical ideological uh, manipulation, that you are not aware of how you are already inscribed into the scene. Yeah. That's why this often happens in good detective novels. Like, I will confess you a private scene. When I was young, I quite liked those good old white and black, uh, black and white, not yet colored, Perry Mason TV series. And I read almost all Ernst and the Gardner's novels. In one of them, there is a wonderful moment of this reflexivity, when a couple is suspected of murder, and they are questioned by police together, husband and wife, and the husband tells in detail what happened. And Perry Mason is surprised, like, why is the guy, even although he is not put under any pressure by police, why is he describing in such a detailed way what allegedly happened? And then he gets the solution. Of course, they did the murder, the couple, but the true addressee, you see, to whom is, is not the police, it's his wife. They were kept in separate cells, and his narrative is, the function of his narrative is to tell his wife to the lie to which they should both stick. He is informing her. You see the beauty, the solution to it is ask who is the addressee of it. To whom? And these mechanisms, I agree with you, are absolutely crucial for ideology. Okay, let's get some on the baseball cap. Thank you. I can try to be shorter. I apologize. It's just we just got to get out of here. We just want to get everyone online. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, so I was going to bring up your point on communism about how it changes the social order and I think that was what you were saying that you move things with change and that is how you define communism almost. I think. No, my point was only we need a collective agency outside the limits of market and state. Yeah, I agree. How would you suggest that we achieve that? What are your views for change? Okay, now I will give you a very desperate answer, which is I, don't, I cannot give you a precise formula how. I only know if we don't do it, we are lost. But if you ask me how do we achieve it, now I will say something that uh, you told me, Costa Stusina said you disagreed, but in a very modest way I would repeat it, what he said. You know, mir miracles, not in the sense of miracles, but in the sense of unexpected things, do happen before they made the compromise. Nobody would have even imagined 10 years ago that something like Syriza could have happened. Nobody would have even imagined 15 years ago that the world, and this is the great result of the last 10 years of United States politics, that the word socialism was rehabilitated, and so on and so on. So I don't, I think. Uh, First, I don't have any problems with strong state power. I'm here a good old-fashioned totalitarian. <laughs> One thing, I can only give you some negative answers. Now, it's very problematic, but I'm here to provoke you. I don't believe in this bullshit of local democracy, you know, like, oh, we live in a small community and we debate uh, uh, common matters, like, blah, blah, blah. That would be even personally a nightmarish. No, I want to live my happy, alienated life. I wouldn't like to live in a small community where in the afternoon I would have to debate how to, how to organize distribution of water, how to organize education of children. I want alienation. I want anonymous, alienated state apparatuses to take care of that. The, the thing that I think can be done, I don't know how, but I see elements of it. That's the reason it's answer which is deeply unsatisfactory, and so on. But I have no illusions about Europe. But the progressive element in European Union is that it is at least 
a very vague idea of such a transnational body, which nonetheless, in spite of all criticism, guarantees all around, in all countries of European Union, certain basic rights, like against uh, racism, the rights of women, and so on and so on, although now all this is falling apart when they renormalize Hungary and Poland who are openly breaking this rule. But what I'm saying is that, is that uh, I see different elements here and there and I don't have an easy answer to your question in the sense that I, I think that this is even the mega problem and here I get in trouble with some leftists who claim, oh, Venezuela, horror, uh, uh, Gaidor, how is he called, American puppet, and so on and so on. Yes, I agree with all of this, but as all chavistas with whom I spoke privately, they just don't want to tell it publicly, privately they admitted to me, look, whatever, you can attribute many reasons for deep troubles in Venezuela to, of course, American intervention, extremely brutal pressure, and so on and so on. But the fact remains that they really did not invent a new model. Chavez was for me nonetheless ultimately Fidel Castro with a lot of money. And he was not really solving problems, he had enough money to throw money at problems. So, uh, uh, so my idea would be precisely to be very pragmatic here cooperation within state, international police forces. I love the idea of international police forces, which can intervene here, there, when there is violence against immigrants, and so on, and so on, and so on. I just don't believe in populism. I don't believe in popular mobilization. Why not? All, you know, I'm here against Maoism. If by Maoism you mean we alienated intellectuals, we should turn to ordinary people and listen to their wisdom. Well, if you do this today in Europe, the message is unambiguous. Throw the immigrants out. And of course, when I mentioned this to my friends, like even Varoufakis, he said, yes, because the people are manipulated and so on and so on. Then I asked him, but how will you de-manipulate the people? No, only through strong state, I claim, and so on and so on. So the, the point is that, and that's my horrible position, I believe in, I wouldn't say that's too much, now I'm consciously provoking you, in some kind of, no, dictatorship is not a good word, but a true progressive leader should not be afraid to consciously act against the majority. Majority is simply often wrong of the people. It's clear in Europe today. The only bright spot was when Angela Merkel invited one million people. This was a short miracle where even 60% of Germans at that point supported her. Now it's over. What should a politician who wants to be a good leftist and wants to address the problem of immigrants do today. You should gather the courage to act against the will of the majority. And what all authentic politicians are doing, to hope that through the success of your politics, retroactively your acts will be redeemed. You have to take the risk. I, I know it's very problem. I know that I didn't answer your question, but <laughs> that's all. That's in my thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know your uh, philosophical theories on uh, the full decriminalization of drugs. Sorry, on your full uh, decriminalization, your full philosophical idea of uh, the decriminalization of drugs. Your opinion on that. Decriminalization. Not just drug decolonization. Decriminalization. Decriminalization of drugs. <laughs> Not like <laughs> marijuana or anything like that. I'm talking about like full, uh, hard. Uh, here, drugs. here, I, I don't know enough about it. But you know what I will say. Not only because my wife is a chain smoker. Now you will probably, if I got, uh, if I got correctly, the underlying point of your question. Probably you will not agree with me. But uh, I find it so strange, I mean, I'm totally opposed to uh, 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 big tobacco companies and so on and so on, but how comes that we focus so much on smoking, 
Like, it happened to me when I visited with my friend, Mladen Dolar, who is a, a smoker, a friend in California. And he just wanted to smoke a cigarette. They said, no, in our home you don't smoke. Then he said, I will go to your garden. They said, no, garden is part of our house. Then Dolar said, can I step out on the street? No, neighbors will see you, they will associate it, blah, blah, blah. And then after this, they started to distribute after dinner strong drugs and so on. I mean, why this exclusive? There is some, I claim the way we, this smoke-free zone, all that, all that, I think it's ideology. I think it's fear of a self. So, uh, can you convince me why drugs, serious drugs, are less dangerous than smoking? I really can't, but um, I would say, no, I honestly can't. I no, think they're all just no. as dangerous. And I hear, maybe here we really disagree. Now I'm consciously provoking you. I think. You might agree. Sorry? <laughs> no, what I don't agree with, what problem I agree with, what I agree with me, is the following is to say people are stupid and don't know what's good for them, at a certain way, states should intervene and prohibit things. I'm not afraid to say this. I don't think that if you, you know, leave to the people the decision and so on and so on. That's why I am for strong state intervention when it plays a good role, like, uh, I don't know, from affirmative action to whatever and so on and so on. I don't believe that people are automatically right. We live in such a confused state. Look at ecology. We talked a lot about it mm -hmm. today here, or I did. And, uh, sorry, immediately. Yeah, but it's three people, so oh, awful. Okay, uh, no, no, just I finish with this idea. Okay, but you know, do we know what to do? There are crazy ideas circulating. Let's spray our, uh, our atmosphere with some chemicals that will prevent uh, sun rays reaching Earth, which can trigger a further catastrophe and so on. Let's admit this radical uncertainty and confusion. It's not just let's be honest and listen to people. This is not the answer. I'm a pessimist here. Thank you, man. Thank you. Although another point, I guess, I never in my life did I take any drugs. But I'm not celebrating it. You know why? Because in my, I'm a kind of a Stalinist fascist, I know the paradox. My idea is this one. It's horrible. It's a joke, but it's a serious joke. That's how I feel. If I take drugs, I will become like beatific passive, and then enemies can attack. And I don't care. Absolutely, I want to control it, you know. Right? <laughs> okay, let's go. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, guys, we're trying to get everybody in. Sorry. I apologize. No, no, no. It's, it's been great. That's why my friends call me Fidel. Not for politics, but, you know, comrades five minutes and then you if, get... If you were Fidel, you would cover four, the uh, microphone uh, and the clock. I'll still love Victoria hours. Siempre, but... Um, <laughs> um, I worry about, like, a, what I see as, like, an essentialist or depoliticized rhetoric surrounding, like, mental health. And now people say that it's like, oh, my brain chemistry is why I'm suffering and not because yeah, of, yeah. like, political hierarchies or oppression. So how is it that we can advocate for people who are like, oh, I'm depressed, I have anxiety, I'm bipolar, without, like, reifying that it's this ontological, okay. like... Yeah. Uh, very brief answer. I deeply agree with the point of your question. You know, in what sense? That's why, not that I'm for male violence, fuck it, I'm ready to uh, advocate death penalty for rapists, but that's why I find suspicious the category of toxic masculinity. Because it changes what is clearly a ideological political phenomenon, male violence, into a medical category. Yeah. The moment this category was introduced, big companies are already making drugs for. Uh, for, uh, against toxic masculinity. No, toxic, ma what we call toxic masculinity, it's a complex social ideological phenomenon. It's not a form of social illness and so on. So maybe we agree here. Okay, let's talk. Yeah. Okay. okay. We have to. Thank you guys for your patience. Hey, I have uh, one criticism and then a question. Uh, I think uh, there's a bit of a contradiction between your views on black liberation and the time of peace. Uh, you spoke about 1945, roughly through 2001, 2005, as yeah. these good times. And in my opinion, I think those were good for the left and the right. But through those times, you still had uh, segregation, uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, and 
and, and through that produce radicalism. Uh, people like Malcolm X, Black Panthers, mm -hmm. and then a lesser degree, Malcolm, um, excuse me, MLK. Now, all those people were killed and assassinated. Yeah. Now, we fast forward now and you say, things are crazy. But from the black experience, things haven't truly changed in a way. We have no leaders really speaking, uh, Obama in a sense, but through the institution of you know, being a president, we don't have any true leaders anymore. So it seems this hysteria is just based off the left and the right not agreeing anymore and not truly taking the experiences of everybody. Would you agree or not? I, I do agree, but I think, that, okay, I can only give you a very brief answer. Yeah, I First, I totally agree in a very non-traditional way that good leaders are needed. We need leaders. I'm here again for a because you know, leader is not necessarily that master figure and so on. In our daily lives, when we are just individuals following our instincts or our cravings and so on, we are not really free. We are just in, in slaves of our spontaneous ideology. And for me, the true function of an authentic leader is to basically to pull you out of this inertia of everyday ideology. To tell you, no, you can reach beyond yourself. You can do it. And the leader, in this sense, is not the one who knows things for you. It's more the one who opens up the space to be more radical for you. We need an external push. Why is this not happening? Ah, I don't have time, I'm very brief to finish it, but my point would have been that that's the problem today, that a new form of social conformism is emerging where those in power even subtly manipulate the new role for women. Today, uh, uh, women are not just still oppressed, but the new functioning of power, which is no longer the old oppressive power, but the more, let's call it, therapeutic power, you know, like pro problems like gang violence are treated like medical problems, you need help, and so on and so on. It's all in this spontaneous ethics where there is no place for leaders, then you get leaders like Trump who are the return of the repressed and so on and so on. So I, uh, I, I don't have a simple answer how to do it, right. but I agree with your point that leaders are necessary. A leader is the one who simply resuscitates you. Who, you following him doesn't mean I obey you, it right. means as it were, you open up the space for my freedom. Sorry, I know I didn't answer, but... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Ah, the last yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, growing up, um, watching politics becoming politi politicized, um, I noticed that uh, class wasn't a very prominent topic. Um, in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Now we're starting to have a conversation about it. Um, now in one of your other interviews, you also said that men are, um, that, that certain kinds of feminism perhaps uh, attack um, men who are in full retreat. Um, I'm wondering as a male, of color and of uh, low income background, yeah. how um, certain kinds of um, social movements can create antagonisms between um, oppressed people. No, it's a, I don't have time again to go into it, but at some point, if I got correctly the thrust of your question, I tend to agree it, the prohibited topic in some circles is precisely how there is no guarantee that automatically all emancipatory struggles automatically then tend in the same direction. You have many so-called lower income, lower class groups of people for whom feminism is an upper class, upper middle class invention to screw them. 
you also have feminism which clearly is in a subtle way denigrating lower classes. They will not say it publicly, but the idea is we, intellectual middle classes, are know about women's rights and so on and so on. The lower classes, oh, look what the Mexican immigrants are doing to, to, with their women and so on and so on and so on. So we have to be very brutal and open here. Uh, just two examples to make it clear. My favorite example, it's so brutal, I love it. Friends from Mexico informed me about it. In some Mexican small town, they decided that we should listen to old pre-modern wisdom. So they have a kind of a council of old people, well versed in local indigenous tradition, and when there are smaller conflicts, like not, not crime, but rape or whatever, they decide. So it happened that a guy raped his best friend's daughter. Okay, this council decided that the punishment should be that this guy should buy to the father of the raped girl a, a, a big package of 40 bottles of beer and so on, you know. Feminists exploded and so on and they said, sorry, these are our old customs. That's what our old spirit. So again, don't mystify it that we can... Return. Or another example, and with this I finish immediately, my favorite one. I don't know the place, but I have it written in my next book. There was a place somewhere in a campus where this is what happened. It was a rich campus, rich students. They had a swimming pool. The girls there were not naked, but barely dressed just in their bathing suite swimming. And then nearby was a house where Mexican workers, lowly paid, were uh, 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 how do you call it, replastering the wall or whatever. And seeing those girls, they were, of course, doing what I think in Spain they called, or in Latin America, el piropo, these erotic remarks. Yeah, 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 yeah. The girls protested, and it developed into an interesting conflict, because the girls screamed we were harassed sexually. The guys said, no, it was class. We were too low for them. They reacted like this. And what the university did, I love this, is the worst apartheid politically correct solution you can imagine. They covered this whole building in front with a, an additional wall of plastic and they constructed a tunnel under plastic for the workers to approach this building so that they totally separated them. What they don't want to accept is that here you get simply, to put it very simply, a, 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 a point where what is perceived as a class distinction is openly in conflict with what you would perceive as a feminist struggle, and I simply claim that the conflict is genuine. Of course, abstractly, you can say, oh, they should have realized they're really fighting the same struggle, but you know, it's an empty phrase if you don't show how to do it then, and so on and so on. So what, what my only answer at this abstract level to you is, the first step towards solution is not to mystify things, but to openly admit tensions, antagonisms, conflicts, and so on. Nobody has clean hands. You can be a feminist and be involved deeply in class politics. Don't forget that great part of American feminism supported American invasion of Iraq, claiming it will liberate women. I'm sorry to tell you, but uh, whatever you say, and I do say many things, against Saddam Hussein, the role of women under his rule was incredibly better than now in Iraq. So, you know, nobody is clean. We should criticize feminism. We should criticize primitive race. It also exists something called primitive, uh, Trump is mobilizing it, primitive white lower class politics. Trump's image is precisely rich liberal elite to screw up your own American working class are importing Mexicans and so on and so on and so on. The situation is complex, let's admit it. Let's not 
paint this easy picture of the AI progressive struggle, we will all be united and so on. Sorry, I cannot do more now. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. All right. Well, now that everything has been cleared up, let's thank some of you. I'll just announce that next year we're going to do this at Hunter College, and I hope you all come through. All right, thank you guys for coming. I'm grateful. Uh, happy holidays to people. Come to war. Yeah. Yeah. So good fast, and thank you guys again for coming. Thank you. No, sorry, sorry. I just